So Natalie's uh, case was an anomaly and she was, her situation was presented at conferences all over the place because ultimately her entire autonomic system broke. And it was everything from her vision, her speech, her OT, she had seizures, she wasn't making tears any longer, you know, the droopy mouth. I mean, her heart, she had heart conditions, she had systemic swelling um, where she couldn't walk. I mean, I literally, everything that we automatically do and functions broke in her body. So it was a long road to recovery, but I wanna say I, I figured it out and that's why I started Power Patients to share my knowledge and to help everybody and created this dashboard. So. With no further ado, let me go back to share screen and pull this up and wrong one. <laughs> Oops, hang on one second. Technical difficulties on the host side. Here we go. All right, can everybody see the screen? I'm seeing you right now. Okay, all right, hang on one second, that's strange. Let me go back down. All right, now can you see the screen? I can, see, yes. Perfect. Power right. patients. Yep, yeah. That's the one. Okay, so I'm going to go to that. So I just did the intros and uh, a shout out if you have a question, but in the interest of time, I'll just keep going all the way through. We only have 10 slides to start. So the vagus nerve, as you can see in the picture, um, it starts in the very base of your skull. It's your 10th cranial nerve, and it's also our longest uh, nerve that runs throughout our entire body. Now, what's interesting about cranial nerves, there are 12, but this one in particular exits at the brainstem. I'm gonna show you another picture, um, but this is right here. If you see my mouse, it exits at the brainstem and it goes all the way down through the brainstem itself into all different parts of the body, which over here on the right-hand side of the screen are the high-level views of where it's reaching. Now, <clears throat> with my little computer, I've got a teeny laptop, but basically, again, high level, and it spreads into deeper levels, but this is like a 101 class. So this cranial nerve uh, will affect, cranial nerves will affect your pupils, your flow of your saliva, your bronchi, meaning your lung function. The vagus nerve, which is right here where we're starting, is going to also go into your lung function and your heartbeat. It will also address um, your digestion, which is your pancreas and your stomach acids and things like that, liver functions, and down at the bottom, your adrenal gland. Now, each of these go into much deeper layers, but again, let's keep it at the high level. It's important to kind of understand when the vagus nerve is in a good function position before we go into the problems that we have discovered. The vagus nerve, now I'm going to work backwards just a little bit here. Okay, the vagus nerve is made up of what's called parasympathetic fibers. Everything in our body, if you, if you think about it for just one second, is balanced, right? We have our right side and our left side. We have two eyes. Um, we have the parasympathetic system and we have our sympathetic system. This is the complement to one another. Our parasympathetic system is a part of our autonomic system, okay? And that was the piece that I was discussing or said to you all early in the beginning about Natalie's autonomic system broke, pretty much everything. So our parasympathetic system is in charge of our rest and digest phase, meaning this is where we're always relaxed. Our sympathetic system is our response stage, right? Where we are going to flight or fight. We've already heard that before. Um, and there's a reason I'm bringing this in, even though the vagus nerve is a part of the autonomic system, there's a reason I wanna talk about the sympathetic system because that's where her messages were mixed up. And if I can you know, enlighten or share stuff with people, that's great. So, Without an injury, so here we have this high level view again. Without an injury, 
we have all of these functions working without thought, meaning our breathing is automatic, right? Our heart rate is automatic. All of the peristalsis in our stomach, every digestion is always automatic. We have to go to the bathroom, it's automatic, right? This is what broke. Now, for people who don't know, Natalie was hit in her left temple um, and was knocked out, her optic nerve sheared, and subsequently stroked afterwards. The single hit did cause permanent spots on her brain and brain damage as well. Um, and one of the things that we kept being told to rehab were the ends, these problems down here, instead of going all the way back up to where the brain, you know, the actual injury was. So an example of my problems that I had with my colleagues, and I mean this sincerely, I design clinical trial research for a living, and when, in, when drugs, et cetera, are not indicated for a specific um, disease or condition, I will challenge a physician. So an example is, my daughter was having heart attacks, or what was a facsimile of a heart attack, meaning her heart rate would drop below 40 and escalate above 200 within split seconds. And she would literally be passing out at a table or in bed under really no duress. So it was very challenging to even see how far she could walk. When she went through her EKGs, so this is why the normal functions are important to understand. When she went through the EKG tests and all the stress tests and the cardiovascular everything, everything mechanically came back normal. But all they would want to do is say, okay, well, let's just put her on these blood pressure meds. And my point was, why? She doesn't have a blood pressure problem. And again, backing up, she was an athlete. So she had none of these problems here on the end. I kept saying to them, it's in her head, it's from her injury. So I understand, and we all have to go through this in the US um, for the sake of Danny, who's over in Ireland. In the US, they have to rule everything out before they wanna listen and try something different. So stick to your guns when you know that there's no interference prior to your injury. Keep bringing that up because that's going to be your best um, method to communicate what's really happening. All right, so also involved with this vagus nerve. So down here, see how the vagus nerve goes into the, the gut? This is really important because 80% of our vagus nerve fibers, this is on this side, has to deal with information going back up, if you see the signal going back up to the brain. So our brain is only sending 20% information back down to all these other systems. And that's, that's an 80-20 rule, which is really kind of amazing. When I first learned this, I would have thought the opposite existed, meaning I would have thought 80% of all of my brain information is what's being distributed throughout my body. But in this case, it's different. And this is where in Natalie's digestion issues and her um, bowel functions and everything, all of those issues was getting so mixed up. It kept sending all these like false alarms going back up. All right, so this is why it's important, why there could be a confusion and you have to really isolate one at a time. That was how I was able to really isolate for both of my kids. All right, this is a very, very small overview of the two functions that I just talked about, and I'm adding a third now. So we have the Paris, this is all a part of our autonomic system, right? Everything that we do automatically. We have our parasympathetic system, everything is relaxed, and this is where we should be all the time. When we are challenged, we have this crazy adrenaline kick, it's your cortisol levels going off, and you go into this flight or fight. Now this is important. I'm gonna back up one slide. This is important here. Down, these are your adrenals. They sit on top of your kidneys. So Natalie was getting or was told to get, oh, she's so stressed out, her adrenals in her lab work were not functioning well. Let's give her these medicines. Now I bought into that one because I thought, yes, yeah, she is stressed out because I could see the stress, I could see the panic and you know, she lost her life. So I, I could believe that. 
They didn't do anything. They did absolutely nothing. She was stuck in this phase. And this is where the communication messaging going back and forth from all different parts of our body through the vagus nerve up to the brain was getting really mixed up. Now, what started to happen, and this I, was- Can really I ask a quick question? Yep. So can you make these available afterwards or should I try and like quickly <laughs> write all this down? No, no, I actually am going to post these. I have right, been okay. saving them. Yeah, That's it'll be on the dashboard. Problem. That's yep. absolutely no problem. I'll, yep. I'll yep. focus more on listening. I appreciate yep. it. Yep, sure. So in so what was happening, so we have parasympathetic, now we have the flight or fight. So Natalie's stuck in this flight. Like her one eye was wide, wide, wide open, meaning very dilated. Her other eye was hyper constricted. So I, you could just see something was really off. But she was stuck in this like literally like deer in a headlights phase where she she had nothing going on in terms of these are the um, symptoms when you're in this frozen stage, you're numb, you're depressed, you're hopeless, the disassociation. Um, she would go very, very catatonic at times. And I could never really truly understand what was it that I was seeing. So I started breaking all these little pieces apart so I could see what was triggering what, when did it calm down? When did it kick back up? How long did it last for? And this is how we started to really kind of piece together all the different issues that was triggering this right here, this high, whoops, this high level of adrenaline, okay? She stayed in the flight or fight. So now we have all a new set of symptoms that were associated because medically the doctors ruled out there was no cardiovascular problems. She had no diseases. She had hormones right. Her adrenals were not being supported, but the medicine and the supplements didn't help that. Um, she was having speech pathology. She did have swallowing issues for a little while, um, but it seemed to clear up with some of her speech work. Um, she never could smell. She had no sensation of fullness after she went through this like starvation period. There was never any kind of consistency and it seemed like the up and downs were until her brain really finally stopped swelling. Um, but then what was interesting when we had all of our rehab ordered, the way they were rehabilitating her kicked all of these problems back up. And I mean, literally she was passing out within seconds within clinics when she was given uh, different therapies. So her case was very extreme, but I, I vowed I wouldn't let anybody else go through this um, again. So these were all of her, not all of them, there's more, but these were a large number of her symptoms that were trying to be treated. So the postural tachycardia was the biggest concern because if she were to fall again and hit her head, she would lose her eye, was what we were told. So we were working on rehabilitating her eye function through this as well. So of course I wanted to, you know, stick her in a bubble and just not let her go anywhere, but that's not real life. So what has happened, and there's been a few research papers recently coming out that because we have such a lack of knowledge in the traumatic brain injury research area, that many patients are misdiagnosed, meaning in my daughter's case, okay, well, she has a heart condition. Well, she doesn't have a heart condition. And then the, they want to label you, okay, well, she has postural tachycardia. But by definition, postural tachycardia means your heart rate just goes up, 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 up. In Natalie's case, hers would drop every single time and then escalate. There was a sweet spot where we could predict, finally, we were doing heart rate measurements, we could predict when we knew she was gonna fall down. So again, it was almost postural tachycardia, but it wasn't quite that. So what their solution for that one was to put her on birth control pill. Well, that doesn't work either, right? So I mean, they look for solutions that don't make sense and this is, the more we ourselves know, the better we will be able to get our own treatment. Okay, now I, re I alluded to some of her conditions. So often, and this happened to another young girl that was sitting next to us in the clinic, she would stand up and she'd be dizzy, 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 lightheaded, she might faint. 
And this is why they thought it was a hormonal thing because they both were in their teens. Uh, they both were, you know, having normal periods, but they felt that, oh, if we could just make their periods a little more normal, I don't know how you can do that, but anyway, we'll put them on birth control pill. We, they believed that they would stop this. Well, it really was not the case. But what this young girl had was an undiagnosed TBI, it turned out, as she was sharing her story. So these are the different symptoms, and you don't have to have them all at the same time. This is the unusual thing. Sometimes Natalie would be so nauseous with none of the other symptoms and then pass out. Sometimes there was this ringing in their ears. So again, there's often a lot of confusion, and this is the lack of knowledge. Now, I harped on this a little bit, and this is where I come from again, clinical trials. Our healthcare system operates by studying everything to death, and then we publish, and then it becomes approved by the FDA, and then it's brought into the healthcare practice. Just so you know, ever since the US government has been tracking research for traumatic brain injuries, which is since 1989, okay? That's when they started tracking it. They actually started tracking all uh, research, um, excuse me, 1986. Um, the comparison number that is going to probably shock you all is there has been 1,200 traumatic brain injury trials done so far year to date. Now, the number of cancer trials that have been done so far in the exact same time span is 57,000. I mean, it's a horrible, horrible imbalance. And our brain is our most important organ. So I don't know why, you know, I'm not in charge of grant money, but I know that it's going to change if I have anything to do with it. So number three is oncology. Pain is our number one funded um, research therapeutic area. And there are 150,000 studies on pain. Wow. So this is the imbalance. And this is why I'm doing what I did. So in what I also have discovered, here we have our nervous system. Okay, so back in the beginning, remember I said, I want to talk a little bit about parasympathetic and sympathetic, and it's about the autonomic system. So we have to kind of work backwards just for a second here. Here's, well, I'll go forward. So here's our nervous system. So it breaks down into the peripheral system and then your central nervous system. Now your central nervous system is going to be right here, coming down from your brain all the way down through your spinal cord. Makes sense, right? This is where most neurologists work and study and reside. The peripheral nervous system is where, this is where we find our autonomic and our uh, parasympathetic and sy sympathetic systems. And from this, excuse me, this, this is where it's more of the functional neurology, the functional clinician. So Danny is a speech pathologist. She teaches people how to re-speak, right? You can use different nerve pathways. Um, I, I had surgery a long time ago. I had to have my neck fused and part of my nerves um, were disrupted or broken in my, in my pathway going down to my hand. I had to learn how to use my hand different again. So there are ways and that's what our neuroplasticity is about. But this to me is really important because I myself went from neurologist to neurologist. I was referred you know, through our pediatrician like, okay, we'll try this doctor. Well, the problem was many of them were Alzheimer specialists, Parkinson specialists. None of them had any really good knowledge about traumatic brain injuries. And now maybe that was because of where I was. I was in Charleston, South Carolina at the time, and that's where we lived. But it seems to me that there should have been something more in terms of a referral program. So again, I like to equate a brain injury for just comprehensive purposes that people who have a brain injury, it's broken. So there are things that can be done to rehabilitate that brain. So if I use the analogy, when you break an ankle, you set it and then you rehabilitate it. When we have a break in our brain, we have to find the part that is really injured 
and we have to set it or fix it or stabilize it and then rehabilitate it. So the reason this is important because this includes speech pathology and I learned just recently how well a true speech pathologist who is trained in traumatic brain injury can diagnose the depths of somebody's injury. I was blown away by what I heard. So Danny, hats off to you. Um, the other persons that are very, very important are your, we talked about in previous webinars, are your neurooptometrists or, and that functional part of your eye. The um, vestibular clinicians who really manage your balance and that deals with your inner ear. Occupational therapists. Now there's a couple that I'm going to also throw in there is there's functional um, chiropractors, uh, chiropractors of functional neurology. And they are specialized in the upper cervical section. Now, Natalie went through a year plus with every different kind of therapy. She couldn't manage uh, multiple therapies at one time. So we had a baby step and go through each and every one of them. And we succeeded, you know, everything takes a team. It's a, it's a two person process here. So she graduated out of her therapies, which was great, but then, after she was stable, within three months, she started sliding backwards. She had her eye was starting, the muscles were protruding from her eye again. She started to have a little bit of seizures. She was swaying and starting to trip, which meant she was going to fall. She wasn't able to hold on to things. And I, I was shocked because I thought, my God, you rehab, what has happened here? So if you want to go back for one second, if you just you know, engage me for right here. Um, this part of her brain, the brain stem, and up here is your cervical discs one and two, right at the base. This was counter-rotated. So her cervical disc one was twisted opposite of her cervical disc two. And it turns out it was pressing and pinching this vagus nerve. So what that meant was that she hadn't made tears for over four years and her chronic dry eye was getting so and so severe that they were trying to figure out what surgery could they do, which of course I was, I was very, very nervous over because it didn't sound right. I would ask questions because it just didn't sound logical. And the doctor simply was like, well, we don't know what else to do. So you know, after so many artificial tears, after so many other things, you, you do throw your hands up. But what I want to share with you is there was a video motion x-ray done. It was a very, very simple $300. I was, a, I was not even believing that, I, that this could be a situation or a problem for her. But the video motion x-ray showed how her neck was compressing the vagus nerve. Now, mind you, she couldn't get on a treadmill. She, there was no way she could do a normal walk. She had to go at a very deliberate pace. She had all those little mini seizure problems, uh, no tears. So we went, the doctor adjusted her neck. And it's a very unusual way. I've never seen it before. And um, that night, she started making tears. She wouldn't tell me until the next morning because she thought it was a fluke herself and she was making tears. She didn't even know she was making tears. So what we did was we did a little experiment because she had to go back to rehab for her ocular uh, vision. She had to go back in for another year of therapies to, to preserve what vision we regained. Um, the doctor asked us to just wait. So we did, we waited six weeks, and all I could see her eyes were working because her eyes were so dysfunctional. And in previous uh, webinars, I showed her eyelids swelling and her dilations and things like that. But they stopped doing the weirdness that they were doing, for lack of a better word. So we went forward and uh, then went back, you know, finished the six weeks of therapy. Her neck was stable and went back to her ocular doctor, did not tell her. The ocular doctor did the full exam and basically said, I don't know what you did, but keep doing it. She doesn't have to come back for rehab. And ever since then, and she almost doesn't need glasses anymore, and she started making tears and keeps making tears. I'm not saying this is the only solution, but what I'm saying is she needed everything done. And in what order, I don't know. That's part of the problem that we don't know because we don't have enough research done in the area. So let me go back up here. 
So the vagus nerve is very, very important. And I think you now understand why it's really important because it affects so many different parts of our body. But the thing to know is that the vagus nerve cannot be measured in terms of blood pressure or heart rate. What you want to know is how variable is your heart rate. And that's called a heart rate variability test. And it's a, it's a thing you can buy. You clip on your um, chest, it's like a little monitor. There's a link right here. And again, I will share this information with you. And you want this number to be high. You don't want this number to be, no, to be low because the higher this number is, it tells you that your vagus nerve is functioning well. And this is really, really important. So if your vagus nerve is compressed, in, um, and let me back up, many people will do what's called the um, tilt, T-I-L-T, tilt test. And they do that for postural tachycardia. And they did it with Natalie many, many times. And they really, you know, it would escalate, don't get me wrong, but it would always drop. And they would sit there and go, oh, well, I guess it's just still the same thing. And I would just, and I didn't know, but I simply would just ask, probably because I do research, and I would ask and I say, well, what does the drop mean? And, and it was like crickets. So the drop means it's a vagus nerve issue. So the only way to determine that is through this HRV test. And it's really, really simple. So again, this is more on that functional side of our body. Um, so what can I do to help? Well, the more I can teach people of my, share with people my journey, um, the more I hope to engage you and you bring more people to me and I keep teaching more. And I want us to collectively wake up the research institution. Um, because I do design clinical trials and because I've already told you how bad the clinical trial numbers are for traumatic brain injuries, I want our, our information, our voices to be heard. So I created a free dashboard, right? I will teach about clinical trials as well. So I created this dashboard because I would carry around binders, <laughs> no joke. <laughs> and I would say, no, no, look at this. Now doctors do like data, so they would probably like this. And so I created this dashboard and it's free. You go in and you set it up and you put in your name, you put in how you were injured, symptom, um, yeah, symptoms, and you start tracking, right? And we help you identify triggers that many people don't even know they have these triggers. And I'm gonna use another example. I mentioned, um, well, let me finish here about the dashboard first. So you go in, this is Sally. Sally is Natalie's therapy dog. And so she lives on the dashboard and she becomes animated and she will remind you just like a dog tells you when they have to go out, Sally will tell you, hey, you forgot to track today. So we've gone through many versions of this and the, the people that we tested this on really did help a lot in terms of trying to fine tune this. We keep it very simple. We don't overwhelm people. You can only track three symptoms at a time because people got confused. They were getting tired and I don't want people to become tired on another app. So we're very conscious of that. Um, and every single day you can go in and you track and it's a little sliding scale. You can't really see it on this picture, but it's a slide scale. And I'll show you on our next webinar. I'll actually go through the whole thing. And you get this scale right here. And these are your symptoms. This is a blow up here. These are your symptoms that you have chosen to track along with triggers. And this will show you over time what the heck has been happening. When you see these big peaks, Sally pops up and says, hey, what happened? Now you might not remember, but because the seed was planted for you to start remembering, why did I have such a good day? Maybe you slept a lot. Maybe you had a restful sleep. Or why did I have such a bad day? Well, because I didn't sleep a lot. I mean, that, that's kind of redundant, but there are many things. It could be noise. It could be that you went um, to a, a show that you weren't expecting. You could be in extreme sunlight. So this information is yours and you can share this with your doctors so they can see what your progress is. The ideal scenario is, and using Danny again as an example, sorry, Danny, but if, 
Dandy's a speech pathologist and she knows that there's certain functions and maybe it's um, enunciation or gargling or something that she would like to track on her patients. I intend to work with clinicians in this field so we actually build these dashboards that make sense to them. So these are dashboards that will make sense to you, people with TBI. Then I would like to make sure that we complement that information and if you want to share it, it's all up to you. This is your choice, not not ours. Um, and that's it. So this is exciting. I, we, we put it up into the cloud. Some things broke. We had to fix it. So Thursday, tomorrow, I am testing it one more time and I am so excited to open this up. So that's, that's us. Um, I'm going to stop sharing unless somebody has a question. Hi, Ann. I had, I had a, couple questions it, it might be um, I'm kind of new to all your all your talks this, this is really interesting and helped me put a, a couple different pieces together mm -hmm. um, and I haven't been on a lot of webinars or been able to research much other than reading which is limited um, mm -hmm. um, my sense is that the specialists are fairly fractured um, they all know a little piece of this or that, and I, I'm getting a different lens. And I had some of the same experience you had. Um, obviously, I don't have as deep an issue as I think your daughters had, but um, I had some of the same experiences of, oh, you know, let's try this. I know you may not, you know, it's for a headache, but we know you don't have much of a headache, but well, let's try it anyway. I might help some of the other stuff. Um, the do you have any recommendations for, um, you talked about video motion x-ray. Well, first question was the, with the vagus nerve in specific, do they tend to be a lot of those clustering issues indicate the vagus nerve or can you have a couple up here and not down below? Um, so there may have been some neck issues for me more as much as the head injuries. So it's yeah, now. you know, uh, unfortunately, because research is so scant in this field, there's no predictive model. And one brain injury doesn't mirror another brain injury. So this is, this is part of the problem. Let me, I spoke a lot about Natalie. Alexandria is my oldest daughter. She's had uh, six, four were from volleyball. You would not have thought, right? Repeated concussions. She wasn't living at home at the time she was away at school, so I had not seen her. I can tell you, being able to see Natalie versus not seeing Alex, man, oh man, talk about mother's guilt. I missed a lot of Alex's symptoms. The school was very good in her case where she had a 10 day rest, right? Okay, well, what's 10 days? It's not enough now, now, you know, now that we've learned. But her last two were car accidents. So I can now, in hindsight, looking back at these four, where I wasn't with her, um, she exhibited all these kind of weird things that you were just mentioning, um, like clusters of this and that. But I was like, oh, it's just teen stuff, right, going on. But her last two, she was a passenger in a car and she got rear-ended, barely did anything, right? Just kind of the little corner. She couldn't stop vomiting for over two and a half months. I mean, it was to the point where she was going to have to go on a feeding tube. She had more. Now, she went to the hospital, and they had all of her records of her previous concussions, and she was at Emory, which is a huge research hospital, right? And they missed her TBI. Um, she also, in addition to the, um, the vomiting, she was passing out, and they were like, oh, well, you know, she's just too stressed with school. And I'm like, stress, she's graduating, she's done. That makes no sense. And it wasn't until I actually laid eyes on her. So it was like teeny, it wasn't even like, like barely a scratch, but it was just this cumulative effect. And that was the start of her sweet spot of it being down. Her depression escalated like, like no other to the point where she, she had to get admitted. She wanted to kill herself. And I'm thinking, you're going to law school. You have a kitten and a boyfriend. Life seems to be good. What is going on? And it was all inexplicable. When I finally got to lay eyes on her, and she's the kind of child, my own fault, where she doesn't complain, right? Just suck it up. That's how we were all brought up. Um, I saw 
a response in her that mirrored her sister. And that was when I said, oh my God, you have a TBI. This was all missed. So when I finally got her diagnosed the right way, then the right therapies applied, she completely recovered. Until two days before graduation, she was run over by a car. So to your point, Mary, she, and she's still in rehab. So she's now having the stomach stuff, but the stomach stuff is more gagging, like she's having trouble swallowing as opposed to vomiting. She now has swelling in her eyelids, right? It's not her eyes. And that's, that was the other trigger. Now it's very pronounced. And that's that flight or fight because those eyelids are part of your cortisol responses of that adrenal response in your neuroendocrine system. And so that's why it's so, who knows? So, so somebody could have a couple of the cluster symptoms, but they may not have all of them. And it could be something up, up towards the top or it could just. Right. Yeah. And in Natalie's, to... yeah, in Natalie's case, what, what we noticed also was that as she started to recover, a new symptom seemed to percolate to the top. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. It's, yeah. Someone warned me that it like, as something goes away, something else may come up. And I'm like, Oh, I like, I only have problems with these four things. And then I, yeah. I'm managing two, three of them. Okay, they're going away and then a couple more come up. So it, it's that's right. some of it. And, right. So yeah. I learned, so another little piece of the puzzle here when, so because of being Nat's full-time caregiver, I lost my job. And then eventually I went back to work for the Department of Defense and I managed their TBI portal. And I... <laughs> It was like, oh my God, <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> but I learned more therapies that I had no idea about. And one is the QEEG therapy. So one oh, of oh. it worked like magic. Did but it really? now, yeah. Yeah. Now the soldiers. I was, I was all, looking at it, but it's not covered by any insurance because it's not scientifically proven. And that's um, the whole point. Which Speech is pathology of... for my daughter wasn't covered. Ocular rehab wasn't covered. I mean, uh, none of it was covered. And it, it seems like some of it's just our healthcare system. And you know, everyone specializes child. heart, you know, CNS, you know, this eyes. Yep. I went to my eye specialist and he, because I have another eye condition, he just shrugged his shoulders like... Yeah, um, yeah. So top of I, his line in one thing, but he doesn't know the other aspects of it. So right, and so that's we we have a siloed approach. That's why I showed the two pathways of the of the CNS and the brain. Right, right. that was and helpful. then functional. Right, we have two totally different pathways, and our insurance programs will not pay for stuff until a clinical trial is done. Right. Twelve hundred fifty-seven thousand. I mean. There's your answer. So right you paid for a lot of things just off. You just paid out of your pocket for a lot, right? That's I did. I lost my job because of this. I I don't have the in income, and right. I'm also trying to cover my health care at the same oh, time because I don't have the employment income. So yeah, yep. um, I, I credit card. Yeah, I'm I, trying to I, figure out yeah. which ones are good bets and which ones are. And that's a great question. Bets. So Alex is my live experiment. Okay, so I mean, I know it sounds awful, but but I thought, okay, if and her neck, right? So she was hit by a car. Another car almost ran her over. So, but Emery missed that one. She was released from the hospital. I jumped on the plane the second they called me. I I was down there within three hours, no five, I guess, because of delays. She was released without a single CAT scan or MRI. Mm -hmm. And she was so in the flight or fight. I could tell the second I saw her, she was back in her dorm room. And I'm like, I, you're going back to the hospital. No, mom, no, mom, no, mom. I go, oh, yes, oh, yes. And mm -hmm. within, no joke, two hours, because I made her stay with me in the hotel, within two hours, the vomiting started. Mm -hmm. Within two hours. So to your point, um, Mary, she had this swelling right start well after now i got her to the upper cervical chiropractor because good lord when you're hit by a car you got to have some sort of neck problems right because she rolled up hit and then fell onto the ground um 
So he adjusted her and she was pretty bad. So she had to keep going and getting that adjusted. So, so Natalie, I did the adjustment at the very end. So in the very beginning, I thought, okay, I'll do Alex very beginning because I knew I had to get her into another system because she was leaving Emory. She wasn't going, she was graduating in two days. So I thought, okay, you've got a doctor here. Let's start it. Let's get you settled in. She got into the NYU concussion clinic and everything is always um, a long wait to get into stuff. So she got into the NYU concussion clinic three weeks for her first eval. So during that time, I said, okay, I will pay for you to go to these other doctors. You need to be in here. Now, I will say the NYU concussion clinic was doing great nutritional supplement recommendations. Great. And they wanted, they dismissed her twice. And then again with her, here's what triggered her again. Um, I was a little upset because they did not do a full evaluation for her. Like her spelling was all messed up and backwards and things like that. And I go, you need, you need more workups done. You need to tell them. And so they said, well, if you keep having trouble while you're in school, it, it's okay. We'll, we'll bring you back in. We won't close your case. So this is where the advocacy has to really kind of come in a little bit more. So I went to visit her two months after she when she moved there took her up an elevator she literally fell out of the elevator and did a face plant i mean i caught her but did a face plant because the movement and the motion right now it was a, a high speed elevator but we we actually know the intracranial pressure went bonkers on her yeah she can't be in cars so since that this is the layering effect so she can't be in cars, she can't be on planes, she lives in Manhattan, she can't even get on a subway. So she has to walk everywhere. So her vestibular system was really, really messed up and her ocular system. But it kept presenting after stuff stabilized. So it's, it's this crazy thing. So I can tell you the QEG worked um, and I discovered it because of the soldiers. And Natalie still could not Four and four and a half. Now I'm going to tell you the end of the story is Natalie graduated from college. She went from she was 98 percentile before her injury. She dropped to 37 percentile, so she was mentally challenged. And I I didn't even know how to teach her. Right, so I had a homeschooler. She got a lot of start and stops getting into college and out of college, back in, back out. You know, again, we were trying to figure it out. And she has graduated, and she's actually going to grad school. And she's going to be an accountant, which is amazing. She, she did become a little hyper-focused, you know, in numbers, you know, and, and she's different, right? But she's able to now thrive a little. She does have brain damage, right? And she has spots. And that's a big concern for Alzheimer's and dementia. There's like no question about that. But she could not, up until one year ago, she could not stay awake all day long. Every single day, she took four and a half hour naps every day. And because I discovered the QEG therapy done on the soldiers, I looked into it and it's hard to understand. And I went, okay, there's, I looked at all the research papers and I'm like, okay, there's no reason to not try this. In five visits, she started to sleep through the entire night where she actually woke up rested. So her cortisol levels before this were triple hours and they were opposite. So when our cortisol levels drop at the end of the day, right? And then it resets itself at night, the brain shuts off to reset itself. Hers and most TBI people, their cortisol levels are in hyper mode the brain never rests. That's that flight or fight, those three little faces. You're stuck right there. It reset her. Did it really? So, yeah. so they, they took brain images last summer and they said, yeah, you could use, it would really help you. Yeah. But because there wasn't any scientific reason. I know the, the military often has dug a lot deeper into some areas. So you saw there was, there was evidence that it was really working with some of the military people. Yeah, yeah. Well, how, why they did it was because a body needed to be back on the field and they wanted their soldiers 
back out there. They weren't fully functioning, but they, they had were, they had deficits, but they were staying awake. Right. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, here's to the other questions. Um, how do you find a good QEEG? I I just yeah. kind of randomly pick someone, and they weren't on the the whatever the a national yeah group that tracks them. So I was like hesitant. Um, yeah. Well, I, I stumbled upon that too as well, but it's on my resources page on my website. Okay. Um, okay. There's a company called Brain Core Therapy okay. and they actually are um, headquartered in uh, Beaufort, which is near Hilton Head, South Carolina. Okay. And um, I, I researched them. I called them. <laughs> like, now I, I was familiar with QEEG before. Um, because there was one neurologist in town, just one, that was very much a proponent of this. And he came from the medical university where I was working as well. Mm -hmm. And he was saying all the right things where we can do this, we can do this. It was not drug, drug, drug. He was very, even though he was a neurologist, he was very functional. So we had the initial mapping. Natalie's entire brain was red. Like there was, there was no, everything was, like I said, broken. Right. I didn't understand it at the time. Um, but what he did do was get her assessed. We reviewed it, scheduled her for therapy. And he unfortunately had a heart attack where he almost died and had to close his practice. And so he did not have, because in Charleston, it's not as a, a big town, he did not have somebody in the wings waiting to take over. So we were left. So could that have helped faster? I, yeah, I don't know. Here's, that's the thing. That's where the research comes in. Yeah, I, I hear you about research. Yeah. I, I have yeah. the background in clinical trials too. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah. The, you mentioned functional neurology. How, what is that? Um, yeah, I'm familiar with several of these, but the functional neurologist, I, I knew le know less about do you yeah. Have a resource yeah. Page? Am I taking too much of your time? I want to be careful. No, no. I do have to turn off a of four. That's all. But okay. no, um, no. So functional neurology. So I, I found this group. Uh, let me think. Who referred me to them? Oh, Natalie's optometrist, which was a neuro optometrist, recommended that we go and investigate this functional neurologist. She did not know much about the group, but she was referred to them from a conference that she had recently attended. So it, the best way to describe it is if you take visual therapy um, combined with vestibular therapy and you add in chiropractic to it. Um, yeah, it was really unusual. Now, if, so a functional neurologist, uh, we, so we went, and it's an immersive one week session where all those three disciplines are combined. Okay. Um, now, if I knew about it, I probably would have tried that first, right. but I don't think to be very, very honest, I don't think with Natalie's case, it would have been as successful because it, they use these, um, they look like uh, the avatar machines, you know, where they, you put the mask on, yeah. It was impressive how they were tracking her eye functions, but it, I think that the services we got with the specialist who was a true like um, ocular specialist, yep. a yep. true speech pathologist, we got better results, I do believe, because right. the recommended rehab, Natalie had already proceeded out of that. Right. So, so it's through... Uh, most of them are chiropractors, but some of them are um, doctors of osteopathy, and some of them okay. are general practitioners. And they have this equipment that they combine to try to service their Got um, patients. You. Yeah. Um, but that's what they do. But they don't, they don't adjust upper cervical. That's the interesting part, too. That's fun. Yeah. yeah. No, I have a DO that, does, that shifted everything for me when he started doing some subtle stuff up, up around my neck. So that went from tons of issues down to like, managing some moving parts. So yeah, that, that was something that worked for me. Yeah. Um, I did reach out to the doctors that I've created, you know, really good relationships with, and they all would like to be 
on one of the webinar calls. So we'll just do a wide open Q&A. Do you have multiple webinars? This is the first one I happened to notice that kind of bounced into my email. No, uh, this is, I think, my fourth one. Okay. I, yeah, so not okay. too many, but I do have them. I forgot to record the first one and the second yeah. one I forgot to record. But no, I went back I mean, and, it's, it's a learning curve. It's, yeah. it's fine. It's, I went back and re-recorded them. And then because I, I want this to be a community in and of itself, it has to go on our dashboard so that yep. you have, so it's free, but we just have to put it up on the dashboard. Have to get it in the right place. Got it. Yep. Um, thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? I kind of hog the questions. No, 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 no. Ian, did you have any questions? Are you good? You're on mute. <laughs> I can unmute you. There we go. All right. All right. Well, if that is it, um, then I guess thank you. Uh, this was great. Uh, if you have any questions, email me. I'm happy to help. Um, I will send you whatever information I have. Um, we were thinking about dysautonomia or migraines for our next talk. I don't know yet. I do want to share and show people the dashboard just so they can see it and, you know, get, tell me what you want. I mean, I, I can rewrite code and change stuff and it's really customizable. So, um, and I'm anxious to see what people think. We've done enough focus group stuff, so it's time to just turn it loose to the world. Okay. So, um, all right, we'll spread the word. If you have something that you want me to go and research and investigate, I'm happy to do that too. And uh, all right, keep trying. All right, guys. All right, bye, everybody. Uh huh.